access some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. This is episode, I believe, 338. We're continuing our conversation about Medicare for all, and we're going to give you all the numbers. Uh, going to be honest right up front. If you didn't listen to that other episode, you should definitely go start a part one and then come back to part two. So uh, this is our Anna Karenina on Medicare for all, basically. All right, stay tuned. We will be right back. Warning, this show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the program this evening. My name is Chris Spangle, as you heard the man say in that beautifully crafted uh, introduction. I'm so excited to be back. We're going to finish our uh, conversation about Medicare for All. It basically killed Elizabeth Warren's campaign. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but like I said, if you have not listened to part one, when we jump into it, you're going to you're gonna miss out on a lot. So you really want to listen to part one first, which we'll put in the show notes before you come to chart part two. Uh, so make sure that you you uh, go back and listen to that before you transition to, into this. So if you're new, if you're new with us, then there is a part one to this episode. And uh, this is probably not the best first episode for you to start with um, because it's going to be uh, – uh, a continuation of that second part. Uh, with me tonight is my uh, my favorite co-host uh, ever. It is the one of the best people that I know, one of the best men that I know, and one of the best dads that I know. Uh, I call him daddy all the time just because I respect his father skills so much. It is Harry Price. How are you, Harry? Going good. Going good. Well, thanks for the intro. Thank Absolutely. You. I just really appreciate you and everything that you do. Uh, I, I have some good news for you after we introduce Reinhold, who is going to be joining us a little more regularly because he pisses everybody off, including me, and that's really what you need in, in the world. I feel bad now because I started, Harry, what a great man he is. Reinhold pisses everybody off. <laughs> no, you don't, you, don't, you don't know how close I came to jumping into that introduction and saying thank you, thank you for <laughs> introducing me such a way. Reinhold is one of the best informed, smartest people that I know, and I find him infinitely fascinating, even if sometimes irritating, but that's what I'm looking for in a co-host. Uh, these two are irritating, and that's why they're here. They're here to make me crazy, which is funny. I'm, um, I'm one of the most blocked libertarians on Facebook. Oh, without a doubt. We, we, you know what? I said this morning we're no longer going to cover the LP on We Are Libertarians. <laughs> we're going to cover policy and history sure. and politics from a from – a, normie standpoint and and get out of the trenches of all the libertarian party bullshit and the idiots that are running for national chair mm -hmm. and president and i almost just said you know what we really need to do an episode on why joshua smith is the worst person to run the libertarian party and we're not going to do it you know if you want if you want to know why joshua smith's a terrible choice then you can go back in our files and listen to old episodes or you can just message reinhold i could care less um, I'm pretty <laughs> shocked that certain people are endorsing this person because it's woefully in, in, inept in terms of running the party. Um, but <laughs> Reinhold is – Reinhold just go, goes around Libertarian Party Facebook and gets blocked because he's just – I don't think it's that you're rude. You're not rude. You don't name call ever. It's just that you present facts as you see them that – often especially with the Mises crowd completely uh counter it's totally opposite of what they think right and, and i think a lot of the times and and this is me tooting my own horn about this i guess but i think sometimes i put it in a way that kind of just cuts through the bowl and gets right to the heart of what they're really saying and they can't handle that yeah right and, uh, harry is our resident anarchist although he's so anarchist he doesn't recall himself that um, so yeah, we, we, we try to represent a broad spectrum of libertarians and, uh, but 
you know, that's that's the good news, Harry, is that we have been picked up for 2020. Uh, we are libertarians will still exist next year. I will be very candid. I did a longer, about an hour long bonus episode for patrons about a month ago, and uh, several people are like, please don't quit. Um, because frankly, I, I get in the headspace once or twice a year where I'm just like, I don't want to do this anymore. I've done this show for eight years. My interests change and, and d develop differently. And while I have become more and more of an anarchist, I care less and less about libertarian party and libertarian movement people. Um, and that's sort of like one of those things where it's like, you, you, if you want to sit at the cool kids table, then you've got to talk about certain things and be around certain people and suck the right dicks. And I'm just not that type of person. I never will be. Um, I do a show about what interests me and my interests are kind of moving away from what the libertarian movement interests are. And mm -hmm. I'll be very frank. I really feel like next year you're going to see a lot of libertarian movement figures suck up to the MAGA crowd and Donald Trump. And uh, I will never do that. I, I, Oh, it's already happening. It it is. But yeah, uh, sickening I, actually. Yeah, I heard one podcast today had somebody on that was basically just giving the the president's the president's argument about Ukraine, which is just a complete fabrication of the truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this person, I respect both of these people, but it was just like, what am I listening to? Am I listening to a libertarian podcast or an RT podcast? I mean, it was fucking mystifying so uh i'm very concerned about where the libertarian movement is going and i'm just not interested in, in going down that path and trying to hang out at the cool kids table anymore and so, you know we're going to keep doing what we've done for a long time here at we are libertarians which is continue doing these deep dives giving you more history giving you more explanation because of my place in non-political media on a co major comedy podcast, working on a major radio show. I have a lot of new people coming, searching out the podcast, searching out the name. We're going to have a ton of new people because of presidential election, searching out libertarian podcasts. And I've got us positioned with SEO to make sure that we're, you know, one of those people that get pinged a lot. And mm -hmm. so what we do here is try to talk directly to newer people, people who don't know a lot about politics, people who don't know a lot about libertarianism. Um, and so it's, as the movement gets a little bit more of a circle jerk, we get a little more alienated from it, and that used to really bug me. And you know what? I no longer give a shit. And so I just, at, at, at somewhere around the fall time, just started thinking, you know, it's really hard to do these shows because they're becoming more Dan Carlin-like. <laughs> they're becoming mm -hmm. more like hardcore history episodes where it's really tough to do um, – you know, a 90 minute episode where you're giving every, you're giving the historical background, the, de the set details of a Medicare for all plan. You're trying to, to fit a lot in here. So people understand this stuff. Um, it's becoming harder to do the show. It's harder to do the research, but it's like, man, do I want to keep doing this? Because I frankly don't like a lot of libertarians. I like the people that listen to the show, but the people that have been libertarians for longer than 10 years, they turn into psychos for some reason. I don't get it. Um, maybe that well, they, includes me. Well, they narrow themselves down into these little echo chambers and uh, deep, deep, well, um, philosophical discussions and debates that you have to basically study for seven years to figure out what they're even talking about mm -hmm. for it to make any sense. Yeah. And it's like, okay, Andrew, I agree with a lot of what you're saying right now, but you can't present that to people who aren't libertarians because they're just going to go, no, that's, that sounds crazy and walk away because they, they don't have the basis they need to understand it. They're just going about it the completely wrong way on this. There's just two ways to do a libertarian show or a libertarian media outlet. It is to give red meat to the base, which there's nothing wrong with that, or it's to talk to people as if they don't know what the fuck you're talking about. And there's a lot more money and a lot more attention and a lot more exposure in the route of you know, I'm going to do an episode on breaking down the Mike Shipley versus Joshua Smith debate. And you're going to get a lot of love on Twitter from a certain group of people. But the 10 to 15,000 that listen to the show an episode, most of those people have never heard those names and never will and don't care. They want to know how, what is Medicare for all? What is Iran? What is, so that's the, the path that we're going down. I, I will, admit and have apologized especially to patrons for the 
lack of consistency, the lessening content. Uh, over the past year, I've had some very good personal developments that have taken a lot of, of time. Some of that stuff is is lessening. The burden is lessening there. Uh, burden's not the right word, but um, the time... Workload. Time suck. <laughs> yeah, I don't know a positive way to put it, but... Um, and the like all the various podcasts that I'm working on, I'm doing a lot of great personal stuff because I just needed to do something that interests me, but I love this show. I was telling the bonus people, we do about 20, 10 to 30 minutes per episode extra for the patrons before uh, the episodes. And I was just saying to them, like the pat down, the comedy podcast that I do is five, seven, eight, nine times the size of this audience. So I hear from them a lot more. Uh, I hear from the day job people a lot more, but I had a couple people like message me and say, Hey, we are libertarians is really awesome. That is like, that makes my day. <laughs> and it gives me like three extra weeks. Cause when people like communicate back that they're really enjoying the show, they're really like liking what we're doing. They're getting something of value out of this show that mm -hmm. really helps me know that uh, I should keep doing this and that I should keep putting forth the effort and the massive amount of reading time and organization of trying to recruit people to do research or new shows or organizing this stuff or taking, you know, four to five hours on a week just to record. Um, and, it, and it takes a lot for these guys, too. It takes a lot, several other people. So um, really, really appreciate everybody who listens and I'd love for you to join our Facebook group or discord. Uh, you can go to wearelibertarians.com and click the links there. Love for you to just ha let's have, make this a two way street, not just me talking into your ear, but join the Facebook group or discord and chat with other. We are libertarians listeners. Um, shoot me a note and just say, Hey, I really appreciate uh, the show. And that, that, that really, keeps us going because this is a lot of work we do enjoy doing it but it is a lot of work and it's like if you don't hear from people as much you just sort of go maybe nobody's listening anymore i know uh that may just be my insecurity reinhold but <laughs> <how> <laughs> no it's the same because i had the same thing happen this week where i was looking into discord and someone had commented that they appreciated that i was on the ups on the uh the show more often so they appreciated me being on here and i was just like that made my day yeah. And I'd had a, a rough day and it was just later at night and I was just tired. And I read that and I was like, I, I can go out and, you know, take on the world right now just because I got that, that positive feedback. It's, it's very rare people get positive feedback and it's, it's so meaningful when it happens. Yes. Yeah, so see Harry, I told you that Fiverr money was well spent. <laughs> All right. You win this one. All right. We'll do it again. Oh. <laughs> But yeah, it's yeah, because it is a lot of uh, it's a lot of work because especially trying to go as you try to increase co-hosts, uh, which is like herding cats most of the time. <laughs> you know, things happen. You know, so yeah, we, I'm. It does help. It also helps when you're sitting there and you want to go play a video game or read something fun, and you end up reading something goofy at lunchtime that you don't want to read because <laughs> it's just like oh that again this again but i think that here's the bottom line for me is uh but you know i was go ahead harry sorry i was gonna say but like i do like the, the idea of getting raised from the libertarian party stuff because a lot of the especially more of the national libertarian party stuff kind of i just kind of roll my eyes and like oh god these guys again and it just seems like the the worst chuckleheads you know and you know they care the most and they get in they try to get into do different things and it's like and it's hard for me to really want to comment on it because like you know what i'm not there and i'm not doing it and i'm not willing to put that hat on so fine that that's the chucklehead you guys want to roll with roll with that chucklehead yeah the problem with the future of the libertarian movement is as it has grown it's become more clickish and clickishness is the antithesis to intellectual development if you are tying yourself to personalities first and foremost, as opposed to uh, ideas, you are going to be more easily swayed. Mm -hmm. And so there are people out there who will take advantage of the clickish nature of things to build their audience and to grow their audience. Uh, I'm not one of those people. I don't give a fuck if you listen or not. Like I used to sit there and, <laughs> He does. Please listen. He very much cares, but I, I, I cares. do. Please listen. I do care, but he's, I'm but he's not going to change what he's doing in order to yes. get you to listen. Here's what I mean. I, I 
I used to follow the download numbers constantly. <laughs> and you, you at a certain point in your podcast career, especially when it starts growing a thousand a month, like it was in 2017, you go, holy shit, holy shit. Uh, and you get addicted to that growth. You get addicted to the new revenue that you're getting. You get addicted to those metrics and you lose sight sometimes of the actual lives that you're affecting on the other end of that. And so you can get kind of seduced by that. And I think there are elements within the libertarian movement or really just po po politics as a whole in the mm. internet age. I'm, I shouldn't pick on just libertarians because it is a... So it, fun, though. Yeah, it's a pandemic that's happening in political media in that people care more about their numbers and their metrics and keeping that going and the techniques that it takes to make that happen than they do what they're putting into the heads of the people that are listening uh, and so I hope that everybody that listens to this show knows that just based on the show notes and the amount of transparency that we try to give to you about where we're getting in our, our information and how and what it looks like and how it's structured. And, uh, you know, if you, you can go back and listen to my development in a lot of ways, we, we want you to know that that's really sort of my point is that uh, I, I had a long conversation with myself for a couple months about the future of the show and saying, I need to do it or I need to not do it. And I was leaning towards shutting it down. But the loss of friendships and the loss of the connection with this audience and the loss of just the community would be more than I could handle because the listeners to the show are amazing. My co-hosts, my friends that, that come out of this, the research team, the just the various people. I, just, I wasn't willing to make that sacrifice. And so... Uh, the the only answer is ever forward and how do i do a show when i don't really like politics anymore how do i do a show when i don't really give a fuck about a lot of the conversations going on in, in the news like it, it's it's difficult to read the news when you just it's not that i don't care it's just that it's so superficial sometimes and so uh but we had a string of like the medicare shows and some some mm -hmm. others where i was just like the intellectual stimulation that I get from the show is amazing too. And uh, this is just a problem. And so really where, where I want us to go is to think more as, as a podcast about how do we, we, how do we continue our mission of helping you sound smarter with your friends? Um, over the next few years, I'm going to really dig down on what is the history of the intellectual, what, what is the history of ideologies? Where does, you know, where does the modern right come from and where does their thinking come from and who are the influential people in the past that have shaped the, the, the right's brain and the left's brain and the libertarian's brain and help you to think about why you think what you think um, because that's all this show is. It's me trying to figure out what I believe and putting the results out there. I'm not the type of person who's telling you this is what you ought to believe. Um, you know, I have a definite point of view. But if you listen to the show for any period of time, I change my mind often <laughs> because I'm just trying to figure this stuff out, too. So I'm going to be a little more systematic about that um, in, in preparing you to understand politics and the world around you. Uh, and so I just would appreciate your continued support. If you do appreciate the show, if you do listen, if you're one of our super fans, then get engaged in the community. Come and talk to us. Make sure you give us feedback. Feel free to send me DMs on any platform or emails or, or whatever, because I, I really do appreciate hearing from this audience, and I, and I haven't heard from them as much this year, and, and that's totally on me. Um, but I, I just wanted to say that uh, I recognize that I've been a little bit absent. We've continued to do the show, but we've done less shows than we did the last two years. Um, and I'm, I'm recommitting myself to this a little bit and uh, just – one of those people came from um, a guy named Mitch. Now, I have pre-publicly apologized to Mitch because now, Mitch, you may remember this name. You may not. I don't know how to say his name because I'm retarded. When it, well, I have to edit that <clears> out. <throat> I keep using that. I'm sorry. I keep using that word. I am stupid when it comes to pronouncing names. I can't do it. Um, Mitchell... Mankiewicz uh, sent us a great microphone that I'm talking into right now and sent a great letter. Uh, he's a patron, and uh, he has this to say. Hey, man, I know this is a random message early in the morning, but I wanted to say I appreciate the work you do, especially with We Are Libertarians. 
Y'all have kept me grounded as I have been falling down the ANCAP hole. I'm going to be sending something from the wish list. Uh, seriously, thank you for what you do. And so letters like that really do mean a lot. And uh, we really do appreciate that in addition, uh, in addition and as much as we do the equipment gift. Um, and thank you to everybody who is a patron of this show. They're the ones who keep the lights on. I'm developing two new podcasts that have um, a bent towards brand new libertarians and uh, kind of helping explain politics for the brand new uh, libertarians that we're going to see asking, what, what is a libertarian? What do they believe through the presidential year next year? And each one of these podcasts that are on the network costs, costs me around 50 bucks a month. Uh, so it's, it's important that we continue the Patreon support. And I want to give a special thank you to everybody who donates $100 a month, especially Craig DaCosta, Christy Avery, Jason Doolittle, uh, some of our longest donors and uh, most generous. And I really thank them. Uh, Jason, uh, said Jason. Um, Jeff Bennett, Matthew Durbin, and Ed Brehob. Thank you guys so much for being $100 a month patrons. We really do appreciate it. So in summation, uh, We Are Libertarians has been renewed for another year. I'm going to be more consistent. Uh, we are going to do some cool new things that uh, a lot of other libertarian podcasts might not be doing in a fairly systematic way and uh, we want you to hear from you we want to get feedback from you and we want to talk to you so please uh, get engaged in the program any other thoughts on that stuff fellas All right. so one thing yeah one thing i wanted to bring up let's have no talk for a moment and then talk all Look, at once. i i like to i like to say you know when you ask that question i usually defer to harry because he's the co you know the official oh. best co-host and the great dad and all that stuff um so that's why i usually take a beat before i would i jump in but um one thing i did want to say though is that um there are some lp things i i do want to kind of talk about and there's been discussions of we may be doing something as a bonus type of thing on that so i'll talk to you about that later but okay. um paul has been yelling at me to do something so who um, just some guy named Paul. Oh, okay. Um, Never so we'll see, we'll see how that, that turns out. But yeah, I think, uh, we really need, I like the idea of the focus of, of what is libertarianism and trying to reach out to all the new people who are just so fed up with what's going on on the right, what's going on on the left and the childishness that you see in the hearings these days. And it's just, it's just so tedious and, you know, people are getting fed up and mm -hmm. having somewhere to go to say, okay, what, what is this again? Mm -hmm. And getting uh, an explanation that is, you know, not like, well, you're just too stupid to understand it. Here's a book, go read for two years and you'll figure it out. No, it, it's not hard. It's a very simple thing to understand to get into. Um, and then you can go and do all you want to do after that. So um, just, that's just a, uh, that's just a great thing to hear. So, that's it. Yeah, there's yeah, it, and it's nice and it's easy to do and it's fun to do a show that doesn't have like a required reading list. Like before downloading this episode of We're Libertarians, please read this book, this book, and this book because we'll be starting from there. It's you know like some awful level, you know, some awful college course. Yeah. You know? there, there's another libertarian podcast which I don't want to go into, but they're um, basically doing a big sale right now on their entire. Um, uh, curriculum that you can get that's like oh, 200 different episodes and you can pay like 150 bucks on special right now to get the get access to that full entire curriculum that was developed for libertarianism and i'm like really <laughs> <laughs> we could sell that because i might do that someday <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have at 666 episodes in the library in the uh, in the rss feed we have an amazing library of information and what i want to do is systematically kind of think of okay how do I almost turn this into without it being a college course with that just kind of like everybody offers courses but it's like you know i i subscribe to like the cor great courses plus and that's all great and it's very systematic, but some of it's so boring. 
Uh, and so what I want us to kind of think about moving forward is how do we build, I've got 70 years left, hopefully, Lord willing. Uh, and at the end of that 70 years, I want to have such an amazing library of work for the average person to better understand the world and think about things through the lens of liberty. You know, so how do I build that foundation? Because I've been thinking a lot over the last year about what do I want to do in the future? It's like, <laughs> well, I want to be a history teacher or I want to be a pastor or I want to be a radio talk show host or I want to be this. I'm like, you get to do all that here. <laughs> Quit trying to look for the next thing when you're doing the thing that you should be doing for the next 70 years, so focus on it. So I've kind of had to come uh, come to Jesus meeting with myself a little bit the last and stop having such a wondering eye and focus on the work that I feel that I'm called to do. And, uh, you know, that, that that's what this show really will be about. The, the, the network shows will always kind of come and go and people lose interest and we'll always have different co-hosts in it. But it, it really is about me being disciplined about making sure that I'm here every Tuesday, once a week doing this show at the mm -hmm. best level I possibly can. And, you know, not, not slack too much, but uh, I, do forgive me please for the, the occasional skipped weeks because sometimes they're just, I just can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't. Um, and so that's kind of where I want to go. I think Reinhold, you're right. We have such an amazing library of material already that is out in the out free, totally easy to use. All we ask is just that people, if they've learned something from us, if they get something out of this program, if it makes them think in a different way, if you get a laugh, if you enjoy listening, join the Patreon. I use that money then to pay for the network, to launch new shows, and to continue to grow the library of knowledge that we're building here free for everybody. So I'd like to keep it that way. But uh, and, and there's other ways too. If you if you uh, get some value out of the of the of what we're doing and you're in a position where you just can't, you know, do the Patreon thing, then just your kind words, your, uh, some time, if you want to help out on some of the things we're trying to do on the side, that sort of thing, oh, the, reach oh, out to us. Yeah. If you're super rich and you love this yeah. show, send me a million dollars. So there's the opposite of what Ryan was saying. So, <laughs> well, yeah, but the thing is if you get a million dollars are you going to keep doing the show. Oh if yeah, I, you would. If I, get a million, <laughs> if I had a, It'd million, be a daily, right? If I want, <laughs> Yeah, no, if I won the lottery, I would do this show every day. I would do this show for, I'd do an hour show every single day. I would be Jason Stapleton, um, but better looking. So, <laughs> yeah. would you buy a little AM radio station? Do it on. You know, that's actually not a bad idea, but no, I, I think someone asked me the other day, what would you do if you could just, uh, if you won the lottery, what would you do? I'd go, I would sit around and read all day and then talk about what I learned. Mm -hmm. Like, I would literally just sit around and read history books and, you know, and, other books of non-fiction variety and then just talk about what I learned. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm doing what I love already. Uh, I mean, for God's sake, I dreamed about working at Bob and Tom since I was eight years old and, and, and like I'm doing that. Like I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a very fortunate, fortunate, blessed man. So, um, all right, we should actually get to some content instead of all this navel gazing. Uh, we are talking about Medicare for all, as I mentioned, if you didn't listen to part one, we really went into a lot of the regulations. We went into the philosophical problems with a lot of it. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk a lot about the funding of it. We're going to talk about how Elizabeth Warren intends to pay for this. If you have not listened to it and you're still listening to this, then Elizabeth Warren put together a Medicare for all plan. Bernie Sanders wrote, wrote the damn bill and was the champion of this for a very long time, taking Medicare uh, and expanding it to all 360, 70 million Americans. And, uh, but he was always fairly vague about how it would work. And Elizabeth Warren said she agreed with it and was asked for specifics because she's the candidate that has a plan for everything. But she never gave specifics about this one particular thing. So she decided in her infinite wisdom to actually write what she would do if she were president to implement Medicare for all and how it would work. Uh, it turned out to be one of the greatest mistakes in political history. Uh, we are sitting here two or three weeks after we recorded the first episode when she was near a front runner. And this was such a big foobar that she is probably going to drop out within the next month of the recording of this on December 5th, 2019. So we, uh, Man, really, and, really and stupid. In, in a typical socialist fashion, it hit everybody too. All of the candidates took a hit 
and Harris has already dropped out. I mean, this yeah. is how wide ranging it was, right? How hard, shared the... <laughs> how hard did your nipples get when she dropped out of the race? Mine were fully erect. <laughs> it was a, it was a fun day. Aloha, bit. Uh, <laughs> it was, I don't know. It's kind of disappointing, you know, because you got a good sequel with her and Tulsi. So you really was hoping for that third. Yeah. Well, here's the funny part. Now they're complaining that all the field is now just uh, old white men. No, no, and it's not. So that's cool. the thing. I know, but that's what the, the the liberals are complaining about. It's not the Republicans are mocking them. Cory it's, Booker is the last. <laughs> But he didn't, hold on. He didn't. He didn't qualify. Oh, he didn't. He didn't qualify. Okay, good. Uh, um, Tulsi may not either. Tulsi didn't, hasn't qualified either. Yang hasn't qualified. So the Steyer. Hold on. Damn, I paid for this microphone. Uh, so no, you didn't. anyways, anyways uh, I, I, I I paid for my microphone. All right, I just muted these two fools. Uh, so the. Uh, Cory Booker, who I used to really like, Cory Booker, um, put out a, a statement, uh, an email blast, basically decrying how there was a lack of diversity after starting with the most diverse field. Well, okay, that still means that Eliz like Elizabeth Warren's still a woman. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard's a woman. Andrew Yang's Asian. Uh, Bernie Sanders is a Jewish atheist. Uh, Pete Buttigieg is an LGBT man, a married man. Like, so Cory Booker saying that diversity only matters if you're uh, a darker pigmentation. Like, I didn't, I didn't quite, you guys can unmute yourself. I was just teasing. Oh, I did. Um, um, I was just going to point out, and Warren's also, what? Native American. Part Native American, yeah. Pocahontas. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's sort of a weird thing where it's like you say there's no diversity on the stage anymore because you're not on the stage and Kamala Harris isn't on the stage, but like, that's still pretty diverse. Yeah, and plus, gender, gender there's, diversity. there's diversity in their in their views and what they're standing for too. I mean, you've got centrists, you've got uh, radical socialists, you've got leftists, progressives. You know, there's the whole gamut of the Democratic Party is represented on that stage. It's not like there's not any diversity in thought. <laughs> about a right. center they're getting is Buttigieg. Okay, that's about as soon as you're getting. I'm not gonna go on. I'm not gonna co-sign on that. It's the most intellectually diverse field. It's fairly. It's, yeah, but it but it's it's Democrat diverse, right? It's oh, not, okay. Okay. It's not like diverse across the entire spectrum of political thought, but for the Democratic Party, you've got from the you got from the Biden and Buttigieg all the way over to Sanders and everything in between. There's mm -hmm. not a ton of massive policy differences other than Medicare for all. I mean, they're. They're not well, Biden wants to keep marijuana illegal and arrest people for that. And you've got, oh, you know, Yang is wanting to do there. UBI. You've got a lot of different thoughts out there, I think. I say this. Mm. Mm. I'm wearing my OK Boomer t-shirt. First off, Yang 2020, but. Um, Shut up. Oh, come on. Come on, Yang. Yang. Was it the Yang Gang thing? Yeah, yeah Yang thing? Gang. Yeah, 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 Yang Gang. That, that Saturday Night Live skit of the last debate was just hilarious if you haven't seen it it's oh, so good all right so this yeah the Saturday Night live uh sketch makes me want biden pre president so i can get more woody harrelson <laughs> yes yes he's so on point with woody harrelson i want that for another four years <laughs> it's like man i just want that but uh but for people who like but their diversity who qualify for this next debate going in so far right is a bunch of old white men and elizabeth ward and yeah, I, I think and Buttigieg is probably going to script time to get in. So, you know, well, we'll see. So uh, this basically killed Elizabeth Warren. And, and as you heard in the first one, there wasn't one good point in favor of it. Uh, and now there isn't any good favor. There isn't any good point in favor of it on this episode either. She'll probably hold on. I think it until Iowa, unless she looks at her war bank and go like, hmm, I'm going to need this for re-election. Take it. Yeah, I think or she or she gets an offer for VP from one of the two front runners that are at right now. So, because yeah. right now it's pretty much Biden and Buttigieg, and those are the more centrist of the group, right? So, yeah. But would Buttigieg pick a Warren though? I don't. 
I don't know. He may look at it and say, I need to shore up the base part. You know, the people on the left, I need to keep them interested while I'm driving towards the center in order to go against Trump. Right. So mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. could be where the thinking there. I so. just never buy that whole thing where you pick a VP and that does anything for you. I just don't think people really care. I think that makes the elite in Washington feel better. Nope. Unless they're from Indiana. No, no, no. It, it's if you pick a bad VP that can hurt you. I don't know if that ever helps you, but not picking a bad one. Like, right, okay, Pete Buttigieg they, has a bad, uh, a, a bad, he has bad favorables with the black community. Mm -hmm. They say it's because of what happened in South Bend, but there's also a very real um, anti LGBT sentiment within a lot of the black community. Yeah, and yeah, big. The picking of Cory Booker or Kamala yeah. Harris is not going to change that. It's not going to do it. Like, the, the, that's all talk show bullshit that if you pick the right person it can help you with a certain segment of the base i just yeah. don't buy it i don't believe that that's ever been the case well personally honestly like he should be picking up he'll probably pick up stacy abrams as his vp if he does get the nomination like what you saying <clears throat> he's that black vote he's that black vote hard this is yeah. what he needs you know, and then it'll help him out with seven Democrats. It's a good move for Buttigieg to pick that up. You know, Indiana, you know, milk toast white boy, pick up that Southern black woman. Boom. All right. Let's jump into the notes and let's okay, talk sorry. about. No, it's fine. I was just ready to move on. Uh, your, your point was very good, Harry. Don't feel insecure. Uh, love you. Long time. Uh, so under, uh, let's get back to the notes and let's get into the details of Medicare for all. Under Medicare for all, hospitals won't be able to force some patients to pay more because the hospital can't agree with their insurance company. Eventually, let's be honest, insurance companies wouldn't exist under this particular plan. Um, so because everyone has good insurance, Warren says providers will have to compete on better care and reduce wait times in order to attract more patients. That's where we left off because the reality is that you can't have a single payer system and have less wait times. You can't if you, you can either have competition and choice, which provides more wait times, or you can have a, a, a standardized single payer system, which means longer wait times. It's just it's an, an impossibility to, to have a single payer system and, and lower wait times. Uh, so she's going to use the force of government to fix that. So um, reining in out of control prescription drug costs, she's going to. Uh, use a suite of aggressive policy tools to net, set net savings targets that will bring down Medicare prices for brand name prescription drugs by 70% and prices for generics by 30% with initial focus on more expensive drugs. Uh, under Medicare for all, the federal government would have real bargaining power to negotiate lower prices for patients and she'll adopt an ultra version of a mechanism outlined in the lower prescription drug cost now act. I wonder what that stands for. L P D C N A. That's that doesn't say any. That acronym doesn't say anything good. Um, so she's going to use taxes uh, to bring manufacturers to the table, and uh, she's going to use the force of government essentially to get lower drug prices. The problem is that it's not necessarily the drug companies that are forcing uh, people to pay more for something like insulin. It's that the insurance companies choose not to cover certain things, or they double dip, or if you get rid of the insurance companies, prices may actually fall. But the problem is once you're going to, once you cut the, the ability for a drug manufacturer like Eli Lilly to make money mm -hmm. by 70%, you're going to get 70% less in, uh, innovation in the drug market. And it's almost become cliche, but the, it's just the truth. If you cut the profits of drug companies, the innovation of drug makers in America, which really set the template for the rest of the world, it's just going to disappear. Right. And, and it's the main reason why a lot of the drug manufacturers that are here in the bio Midwest of the United States and have left most European countries and only go there after they've made their huge bucks here in the United States. Right. So, yeah, they're, they're just, yeah, they'll go overseas. They'll do it elsewhere. They'll move to Ireland or China and make, the, you know, less safe drugs in China, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, Go ahead. Well, did, well yeah, yeah, and there's, there's, there's also probably unknown rules of how different things are bu built. Like a lot of people keep talking about how like the, uh, right, I think Ryan will say this one in the part one episode. It was like, they paid all this much for a saline bag. I was like, no, they probably did. That's probably the price they did, but they negotiated that down. You just didn't see that. 
Yeah. You know, and you know, at first I really didn't believe Reinhold when he said that. I looked it up like, oh crap, he was right. Mm, look at that. <laughs> That's the thing. Most people don't believe anything right. Reinhold says, and then they look it up and they're like, shit. Crap. I I, I get things right once in a while. <laughs> she wants to negotiate with the drug companies uh, as Medicare for all would be basically make them the nine thousand pound gorilla in the zoo and negotiate lower prices. And but would that? And if negotiations fail, listen to this ominous sentiment from Warren. If negotiations fail, I will use two tools. So if I don't get what I want, then I have two you two tools to abuse them. Compulsory license. Uh, compulsory means you don't get a choice. Licensing and public manufacturing. So to allow my administration to ensure patient access to medications uh, as modeled in the Medicare Negotiation and Competitive Licensing Act. Uh, so she would essentially, uh, you're going to have to license, be a licensed drug maker, or we're going to pull that license if you don't do what we want. And then we're going to just manufacture our own drugs and we'll cut you out completely and the government will make drugs. And, and as I asked on the last episode, would either of you ever take a drug manufactured by a government? The people in Flint, Michigan, for instance, are manufacturing drugs. Would you take it? <laughs> Not if I could help it. Right. But it'll be cheap, Reinhold. Remember, I'm I'm technically a disabled veteran. I can go to the VA hospital anytime I want to. I choose not to. I have insurance, and okay. I go to a regular doctor because. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. I shouldn't have to finish. I don't have to finish that sentence. I think everybody knows why. So we, just, so we just force conscription of everyone. We give everyone free college right. and free, free health care. Boom, we just force everyone to go to the military. Exactly. We're done. Done. But, well, no, no, you, you, have, you, you force all the men because you can't do the men and women, right? Oh, so you force so. all the men, and then you, then you have to force uh, marriage, right? Mm, so mm. you have to be married in order to get those benefits. So that way the women are covered too, and then it gets the families thing. This is perfect for the, the right. If they, if, they, if they couched it like that, mm -hmm. I think you get the conservatives on board. <laughs> so Elizabeth Warren is 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 promising that there will be no perverse incentive to deny the prescriptions people need today because the long-term benefits to their health won't benefit their current private insurance company. Now, does anyone on this panel believe that, uh, that the government has ever had anything other than a perverse incentive structure and that you, of course, if you need a drug, you're going to get a drug. That just doesn't happen in a single-payer system where it's just a bounty, a, f a free flowing of medication. It's all in stock. Everybody can have access to all the drugs they want ever. Uh, and those mean, it's just those mean insurance companies that are not letting you have access to the drugs you need. Let the government do it and you'll get everything you want. Exactly. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I think is going to happen. Nowhere, everything and, the government has touched yeah. has turned to gold. God, every, every time every time they get involved it just it, it completely fills every need mm -hmm. no one's left aside politics does not get involved in any way at all mm -hmm. at all yeah, at it's all. perfect solution yep the government has never destroyed any communities by getting Jake massively involved in you know the, on the economics of anything this so, is are we re can we this, rename the show to wall sarcasm yeah, wall because sarcasm. i think we might need to do that for a little oh, man, people start know. believing we're saying what we're saying only seen on the Glenn yeah uh, <laughs> but it, yeah it's oh man the idea is just so bad and like my biggest fear from all this i was uh drunkenly talking about this uh last friday um with some walnuts was that it, what if this turns the? I know I'm jumping. Uh, I'm probably jumping the gun a little bit too much on this. But I think it really is going to start. It's going to turn the insurance company into these massive big three, kind of like Raytheon and um, Lockheed, Lockheed Martin. Like this is what it's going to turn the insurance company to. So, <laughs> these massive well, that's like what, that's what they almost already are, and what they want to be and want to maintain. I mean, everybody has to buy insurance now, so it's going to be huge. Yeah. Oh, it's you're right. Even this, bigger. You're right. This just locks it in. Yeah, that's, that's why the insurance companies were on board for Obamacare and why they're going to be on board for this is because it's going to be written in such a way that it's going to give them so much power they're going to sign on to it. And that's the only way anything like that could get through. And, make, and making them rich. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And it's okay that they can sell it at any price that they yeah. want because what they know they don't have competition. Yeah, what you're doing here is you're just replacing one middleman for another middleman and adding another middleman between the middle two middlemen. Oh, that's right? a good plan. I mean, that can't fail. Harry, if we're going to do this show where you stay at home, you have to fix that fucking smoke detector. You have to change the battery. It's a uh, carbon monoxide and know. smoke detector. You, you cannot do a, a, a professional broadcast with a chirp in the background like that. No one heard that. Nobody heard that. Everybody heard that. Raise your hand if you heard that. I heard it. Oh, okay. Right okay. Home. I'm <laughs> telling you. I, I love have very good hearing though. So. What are you doing? <laughs> Adam Carolla would be so mad at you. No, no, no. He would be disappointed. Ad, Adam Carolla and <laughs> Dr. Drew on Love Line back in the day when they did it, he inevitably somebody would call in with the, the chirp in the background <laughs> and he would just go in Adam Carolla fashion. What what is it with these people that uh, just don't change their smoke detector? Like you just sit there and listen to that chirp. Here, Drew, here's the problem. I'm hyper vigilant, and so I notice it all. And so, I just don't understand the low intelligence person who just listens to a chirp all day. So, it's not nasally enough. I ain't got it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but he has a point. Like you just are you not in your basement and you don't hear that? That doesn't drive you insane. Oh, like I said, it's been doing it for like. Well, he's got headphones years. on. He can only hear what we're putting into it. So right, we hear everything he's putting out into our headphones. But he can't hear what's going on around him and hit through his headphones, He's right? Got a minus. Like, come on. Yeah, but his his mic's not picking it up and sending it back to his mic. Yeah, sure. it really should. He's I, probably got that turned down. Mine mine's set on halfway, so I can hear half of. I can hear myself talk a little bit. If I were Elizabeth Warren, I'd pass a regulation on this. Uh, <laughs> So under Medicare for All, we'll talk a little bit more about the, uh, the funding mechanisms now. So redirecting taxpayer-funded health spending. Under her approach, she's going to redirect $6 trillion in existing state and local government insurance spending into the Medicare for All system. So things like if, if you live in a state, the state's had a choice. You could choose to set up your own exchange under Obamacare, which they did here in Indiana, the Healthy Indiana Plan under Mitch mm -hmm. Daniels. Or you could just buy, you could just send a block of money to Medicare to cover your state. All that Indiana's plan is going to go away. All that money will go back to the uh, Medicare Medicaid system. And uh, under this maintenance of effort requirement, state and local governments will redirect $3.3 trillion of what they currently spend to support Medicaid and the CHIP program, Children's Health Insurance Program, and $2.7 trillion of what they currently spend on employer contributions to private insurance premiums for their employees into Medicare for All. That's right. Let me reread that so you know where your uh, payroll taxes are going. $2.7 trillion of what they currently spend on employer contributions to private insurance premiums for their employees into Medicare for All. Uh, uh, that's not something you pay now. That's the, the non-tax that we'll talk about here in a moment. Uh, they bring down the growth rate of overall health spending. There's a prescient statement. Uh, less money will be spent on health care because innovation will stop and grind to a halt. Mm -hmm. States will pay less than they would have without Medicaid for Medicare for all. So these policy choices represent significant reductions in health care spending over current levels. Compared to the estimate by the Urban Institute, they will save over $7 trillion over 10 years, bringing the expected share of addition, fe additional federal revenue to just over $26 trillion for that period. After incorporating the $6 trillion, they will direct from the state to help fund Medicare. Uh, experts conclude that the total new federal spending required to enact Medicare for All will be $20.5 trillion. $20.5 trillion. <sighs> there has never been a government program that was on target, so that'll probably be about $50 trillion. Oh, God. <laughs> so... How are they going to pay for all of this? Medicare for All puts health care spending on the government's books. So all that money that comes from your employer, from you. So, you know, I, I don't know what the split is, but I know at my work, I pay out of pocket 20, 80% of the cost. Or some people have 50-50. Or I pay 20% of the health care cost. My employer pays 80 uh, if you have a good plan, if you, you know, some places it's you pay 80 and they pay 20 uh, or it's 50, 50, it depends. So all of that spending will now be put on the books of the government, but Medicare for all is about the same price they claim as the current path. 
and cheaper over time. Right now, Americans' total bill for health care is projected to be $52 trillion. So uh, that's right. I should have um, numbered these pages because I just got lost. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you two it's talk okay, among boomer. yourselves while I figure out what I'm doing. I literally just got lost and – had a uh, boomer moment. We get it. Yeah. You're starting. You're starting to wear the the uh, Christmas sweater and <laughs> having the family time with Christmas time. You're 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 catching on. You'll get there soon. I am. So right now, America's total bill for healthcare is projected to be 52 trillion over the next 10 years. So, excuse me. Uh, the 52 trillion dollar number is the totality of the industry. And as we explained in the last, that's anybody who works as a nurse, anybody who works as a doctor, anybody who works in billing, anybody who works for a hospital or an insurance company, all that is gathered into that number of 52 trillion. The problem is that's all private money. That means that if it's private money, that money is generated from other uh, private money. And so it's, it's, uh, not a suck on the overall economy. When you make it public money, that means that you're taxing that money out of the public as opposed to creating it from uh, more ethical means. You're basically, that's where taxation is theft is coming from, uh, that, that phrase. When you, take, when you make it public spending, you're now dragging $52 million out of the economy instead of growing year over year in that $52 trillion number in, with private investment. Um, now, Democrats don't understand that, and they don't care. If they do, uh, they see the, the, the public dollars as a perfectly valid and legitimate uh, expense, and they don't believe – they think it's a myth that if you are, are – you're taking money out of, the, out of the public. Like, that money has to come from somewhere. Like, it isn't just the same type of spending as private spending. I don't feel I explained that very well. Well, you need the public good, the public goods that we've all put together to produce that private dollar that you have. Our public goods went to paying for your public school. Your your the public good went to paying for your public roads, your public defense, and all the other things that you enjoyed living in this civilized society. So we feel, as the public, we need your private dollars. Please, please pay. <laughs> So, actually, I think it's a little bit worse now. It's more a case of where they can actually in their brains accept the fact that most people would pay this money voluntarily. Mm. Right? So we could do this with freely paying for it through charity means or other you know, means, lotteries, things like that. There's all kinds of different ways to do it. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that they also believe that there would be people who would be selfish and not give anything to the, to help out their fellow person. Therefore we need to force everybody to share the load equally. Otherwise it's not fair. Right. right. That's, that's the whole mindset. And it's, it's hard to break someone from that. Um, you know, with the understanding that they're putting a gun to speak to everybody's heads whether you know you agree with what they're doing or not, they're still putting the gun to your head. If you have a bad week or a bad year and you can't afford to pay the taxes you're due to pay, they're gonna take your money, you know, out of your out of any check that you have. They're gonna take and I've had this I've seen this happen where um you know if you if you're getting paid a certain amount of money and you owe somebody money and it goes to a court through a small claims and they garnish your wages. They can take like 10% of your wages until it's paid off. Mm -hmm. Except the government can take 90% and leave you with 10% of what you earn while you're paying back what you owe them. And that's not going to do it for, that's going to put a lot of people in really bad, you know, dire straits, right? So it, it's just, it, it's this thinking that they need to do this to make things fair without understanding the ramifications of what they're doing and what they're supporting. Right. Yeah. And, and, and it's like a lot of them believe that a lot of them will not give up this money freely, that they don't believe in charity, or they believe that greedy rich people and their greedy rich houses will hoard onto their money and not give it out for some freaking reason, because they think anyone who makes six figures is yeah. like Scrooge McDuck. Despite the whole history of, uh, philanthropic, you know, philanthropic uh, 
endeavors by people like Bill Gates and Carnegie and you know the old robber barons. They gave all their money, you know, a lot of their money back into the society. I mean, we well, we yeah. had part of the response from Bill Gates out of this plan is like, what you're going to make me pay more in taxes. And so somebody, some snarky person on Twitter on the left with a blue check mark was like, oh, you're worth $80 billion and you can't give up $9 billion of your money. Well, this is a person that's given $36 billion mm -hmm. to charity, specifically healthcare in Africa mm -hmm. and school systems. Yeah, there was another person who that, had... Hold on, hold on. That person is, you're going to take $9 billion away from somebody that is effectively giving away their money and building programs that are saving lives directly. And you're going to give that $9 billion to a boondoggle that can't manage those resources. What is it like $2 trillion is missing from the Pentagon budget, like all the time, mm -hmm. like allegedly, it, allegedly. Um, yeah. It's just under the couch cushion. So why, <laughs> Bill Gates has every right to go. I've effectively given thirty-six billion dollars away, and that nine billion dollars would be better spent through my hands than yours, because he's right. Mm -hmm. Well, another person that said he'd given, well, I think it might have been Bezos or somebody like that, but they had given like so many billions of dollars to to charity, and and somebody responded, "Well, yeah, but that's only a small percentage of your overall wealth. Do you think you're actually doing any good with that, or you think you're supposed to be lauded for that?" It's like. Yeah, he's given uh, so much to a lot of people. I don't know why you would be upset with that. Right. Other than the fact that you don't think he, he, he should be able to live on whatever money he has. He should be able to live like you are, apparently. Well, people don't understand the difference between income and wealth. Yeah, Just because Jeff Bezos has $50 billion in wealth, that does not mean that he makes $50 billion in income. His income is – now, he can sell his wealth, his mm – -hmm what he created through Amazon and he can get income from that wealth uh, through things like capital gains or just straight income, mm. but it's not the same thing. And it's fundamentally anti-capitalistic. It's, it's the, the attacking of Amazon right now. It's like the guys leftists, if you really want to piss everybody off in America, keep calling everyone racist because they don't support you and then attack Amazon. It's like you really guys you guys really don't want to beat Donald Trump. You would really don't want to shoot this layup. Um, now the money to pay for medic that will come uh, the money to pay for Medicare for all will come from four places. The federal government, state governments, employers and individuals who need care. Uh, now most of these funding sources under Medicare for all. Now she's saying the money for the current healthcare system will come from those four places. I didn't make that clear federal government, state government, employers, and individuals. And that's not really going to change under, uh, under her plan. Uh, existing federal spending on Medicare and Medicaid will help fund Medicare for all. Existing state spending on health insurance will continue in the form of payments to Medicare, but the states would be better off because they'd have more long-term predictability and they'd pay less over time because these costs will grow more slowly than they do today. Existing total private sector employer contributions to health insurance will continue in the form of contributions to Medicare. Are you playing that waifu game, Harry? No, that's no, not that me. Was, that was actually me. All right. I'm going to mute you because you can't behave yourself. Uh, we'll, just... <laughs> well, that was an AP News alert, so I apologize. I'll turn that down. No, you were shooting waifus on Steam. Stop it. Uh, but states would be better off because they'd have more long-term predictability and they'd pay less over time because these costs will grow more slowly. I read that part already. Uh, so, but employers would be better off because under the design of my plan, they'd pay less than they would have otherwise. And we'll get to the employer deduction in a moment. Um, over the next 10 years, she claims that individuals will spend $11 trillion on health care in the form of premiums, deductibles, co-pays, and out-of-pocket costs. That amount will drop to practically zero. Better make sure you add the qualifier before you say that this is free. Um, they can, uh, these experts that she spoke to conclude that it can be done largely with new taxes on financial firms, giant corporations, and the top 1%. Now, there's like $5 trillion worth of wealth in the top 1%. Mm -hmm. So if you liquidate all of their assets and take 100% of it, you've paid for a year, $5 trillion for the first year. But you've basically destroyed the jobs that Amazon creates and Microsoft and all these others. Oh yeah, there'd be what sixty, you know, fifty percent unemployment at least. It, it, based it's off of it. 
just ludicrous. And why so, would why would we lose jobs if we just took the money from the rich CEOs? Okay, it's not right. like they do things. Yeah, but, but uh, that's what I'm saying. They they were they calculated out. You took the entire wealth out of all of that. You could run the government on what six months, four months. You really only need to watch the first Atlas Shrugged movie on Amazon Prime to kind of get the point of Atlas Shrugged. And and, it's and you should only you should only watch the first one. The second one has its moments. The <laughs> third one is an incomprehensible piece of shit. It's really unbelievably bad. It was I so bad they didn't make the last one. So it's just hanging, oh. right? Am, you should, they're all on Amazon Prime. You should watch the third movie and try to understand it. I mean, it's like watching like a Japanese boy band video. Which Gundam, I, right? Right. Whoa, 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 <laughs> whoa. Okay. Whoa. Here's this crazy idea that she has uh, that she claims is not a tax. My idea is that instead of these companies, uh, I've been told not to do my Elizabeth Warren because it's apparently not good, which is not true. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic. We, we all love it, but don't do it. It's perfect. <laughs> but don't do it. It's always all perfect. That's funny, Harry. It was the perfect impression. It was so good. Uh, so instead I, have, I, have, I have to stop right there before you get into it. Did you, and I know this is way out of bounds and out of what we're talking about, but did you hear Trump congratulating himself for calling Macron a uh, two face? No. They caught him on mic off, off side of the camera, off side of the camera talking. And then he says, that was a real funny joke I made when I called him a two face. It was, it was really good. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just it's like the funniest <laughs> thing ever. I had to, sorry. I had to say that. So, uh, Bra breaking news from HuffPo, a new report that the Trump Organization also reveals that the president's preferred makeup brand of choice is, and then you have to click on the link, which I'm not going to do, but apparently Trump wears makeup. Is uh, the yeah, any, of any of those guys might wear makeup. I mean, don't let them fool you. Yeah. yeah. For the camera. The well, trust me, I'll, I'll be, I'm working with my wife on some stuff for me. For me so. Good, please. Uh, the New York Times also, a former InfoWars employee has a story to tell about working for the conspiracy theorist Alex, Alex Jones and finally reaching his limits. So a smear piece that I can't wait to read on Alex Jones in the New York Times. All right, that, this interruption has been brought to you by Major Media. Uh, so over the next 200 years, companies are going to pay less than they otherwise would have, saving $200 billion um, over the next 10 years by sending payments to the federal government for Medicare in the form of an employer Medicare contribution. So, in, so essentially, um, my employer pays, let's say he pays 50 and I pay 50 and I'm no longer going to pay my part of the health insurance and he's going to send, let's say my plan cost him 50,000. Let's say every health insurance plan costs your employer $50,000. What they're essentially going to do is a head tax. So if you employ 100 people, mm -hmm. instead of paying Anthem that $50,000 a year, you're going to pay $50,000 to the federal government. So what most companies are going to do is they're going to drop their insurance plans and people will overwhelm the, the markets because then if they can get out of paying that, then they're not going to. If you're a company that never offered insurance, then you get off scot-free. Uh, and then the companies that did offer good insurance, like my employer, are going to be penalized by having to pay more in taxes. Uh, so they're incentivizing people to drop coverage as this leads up. Um, so then, of course, they'll find ways to find people, and you did this, and you acted badly, and then that fine will be $200,000 on your small business, which is roughly the, the cost of four employees, and so everybody has to work harder because he has to fire four employees to pay the penalty. Uh, so, and the other part of this is that you're going to get lower income, less experienced workers will have less job opportunities because uh, an employer is just going to go, I can't afford to pay this extra tax. I'm going to cut as many people as I can to keep my payment for healthcare to the government low. And uh, so instead of having 10 people on the balance sheet, they'll have six. So you're going to end up with a lot more temp agencies. You're going to end up with a lot more people working part time you're going to end up with a lot more strain on the insurance system because uh, people will have less, um, less options in terms of their health care. So to calculate this new contribution, not tax, contribution, 
Employers would determine what they spent on healthcare over the last few years and divide by that number of employees of the company in those years to arrive at an average healthcare cost per employee. Under the first year of Medicare for All, employers would th then take that average cost, adjust it upwards to account for the overall increase in national healthcare spending um, and multiply it by their total number of government employees. It would be 98% of that amount. Um, if you want to reread that so your head can spin, you can check out our show notes. Um, people who are self-employed would be exempt from making contributions unless they exceed an income threshold. So if you uh, are too good at your job, you will be penalized by Elizabeth Warren. Small businesses, companies with under 50 employees would be exempt from this requirement too. So if you're a company that hires 60 people or 75 people, 15 people will be fired to get under that 50 person threshold and they just won't replace those people. This is an uh, unemployment nightmare. Um, when either new or existing firms exceed this employee threshold, we would phase in a requirement that companies make the contributions equal to the national average cost of healthcare per employee. Employers currently offering health benefits under a collective bargaining agreement will be able to reduce their contribution. Collective bargaining, AKA your union. And so if you're friends with the Democrats, then she's going to give you a nice, it's like a Groupon deal, you know, donate to her campaign and uh, you'll get a little uh, BOGO offer on your contribution. We're falling short of the 8.8 .8 trillion revenue target for the next 10 years. We will make up the lost revenue with a supplemental employer Medicare contribution requirement for big companies with extremely high executive compensation and stock buyback rates. So we'll have another tax to take $8.8 .8 .8 trillion out of the most successful companies in the entire country. Another $1.4 trillion in funding for Medicare for All is generated automatically through existing taxes on the enormous amount of money that will now be returned to individuals' pockets from moving to a Medicare for All system with virtually no individual spending on health care. Um, so essentially, the more money that is put back into the – people will just spend that on health care, and, and that will help s shave some stuff off. So um, they're going to – this is always the, the magical number of, like, we – we need to get this to a certain number. And so I need to figure out how I can make my numbers marketable. Uh, so if we're going to spend $52 trillion on healthcare in the next 10 years, and I need my plan to be $52 trillion so it matches, they always revert to the same thing. Tax evasion and fraud will be cracked down on. Um, despite Medicare fraud now being the number one crime in Florida. <laughs> so... She's right. going to be the one that is going to crack that formula and really get this down. So it, it, it's sort of a self-own. You're basically saying Medicare has a lot of fraud right now. Therefore, I'm going to crack down on it and save money. You want to create the system, enhance the system that already has a ton of fraud. I don't, I don't get this. <laughs> so how do, how do I report this Medicaid fraud? Right. Um, <laughs> Yes. So the federal government has a nearly 15% tax gap between what it collects in taxes and what is actually owed because of a systemic under enforcement of our tax laws, tax evasion and fraud. So more IRS agents. She's going to hire my, more IRS agents. This person would be a great president. This person has the formula for success. If I've ever heard it, it's like Jimmy Carter. Well, but, she, she could just hire all the out of work ICE agents that are going to, yeah. <laughs> yeah and which is going to have the place for all these irs agents and more irs agents work for obama you know so she's going to request that every dollar invested in irs enforcement enforcement brings in six dollars in additional revenue uh so she's going to incentivize the new uh, irs agents that she's going to hire for the criminal investigation division to make sure that for every dollar that they spend on their salaries, they need to bring in $6 of fraud revenue. So what does that tell you? What is that incentive going to do? What that incentive will do is that they will fudge. They will go after small time players like you and me. They will go through you. The, the amount of auditing that will take place of everyone's taxes will be insane. And the amount of penalties that will be there for things that are not being enforced now will be through the roof. It's mm -hmm. sort of the same as uh, city budgets are getting tight and so a small city that can't really raise taxes because they don't have the ability to do so because of something like home rule for instance here in indiana uh, if a city wants to raise taxes they have to go a city or town 
including Indianapolis, if they want to raise taxes, they have to go to the state legislature and get it passed there. Uh, so most cities and states just have crippling budget deficits. How do they make that up? Speeding tickets. Speeding That's- tickets. Works for Martinsville. That's right. Oh, you got a speeding ticket in Martinsville? Oh, no, never, never. Oh, no, no. Well, I'm glad you're alive. No, 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 no. When you hit okay. Martinsville, it's five under. For, for those of you who are not of uh, Indiana persuasion, I am safe in Martinsville. It's encouraged that I come to Martinsville, actually. Harry has to be out by dark. <laughs> yeah. Encouraged to keep going. <laughs> uh, so expand third-party reporting and withholding requirements. So they're going to have more tattletales. And, and so like the tip system in, in restaurants now where they report all your taxes. So they report that you should have gotten tip 20%. So if, if your server, you have to understand this. What, what goes into the tax system in some of these PO point of sale systems is that if, uh, let, let's say I went to dinner for tonight at a place called the Ale Emporium, which is great, Whoop. and uh, I spent $15 on food, so that's a $7 tip or whatever. Um, let's make it easy on myself because I'm done with math. Let's say uh, I spent $10, so that's a $2 tip because I went to Steak and Shake. Well... Let's say I'd just give them a dollar because I thought they were a shitty server. The point of sale system reports on their taxes that they got $2, not $1. So a lot of your servers are getting um, taxed beyond what they're actually getting tipped. So situations like that are going to massively increase. So you'll see somebody like a Patreon, for instance. They Right now, they if I make over a certain threshold, they give me a, double, a W-9. I still report it as income, right? So... Just because Patreon doesn't send me a W-9 or report that to the IRS that they sent me X amount of dollars, I still report it as income because I'm honest. Uh, you know, I just am. And now, you, don't want, you don't want people crawling up your behind. I'm either. a libertarian per- person. Like, I'm a libertarian broadcaster that talks about how much the government sucks. I don't want to get audited. I, I play by the rules. I just think that's ethical. Um, so what they would, in, they would do is they'd go to a Patreon and say, mandatory reporting, you have to turn every W-9 in, and so then they can go after people like me who are cheating. Now, you may say, oh, that's great, but the problem is what happens if somebody like me gets hit with a uh, fine for taxes? And, and i just shut this down. Like, I'd stop, like, yeah, I, I'm not going to lose money this year. I'm going to end up paying taxes on We Are Libertarians next year, and it's probably going to be a good chunk of money. Well, if it's too much money, there comes a point where financially you just go, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> so, uh, and you just shut it down. So you're going to get a lot more of that. Um, you're going to strengthen enforcement of the F- Foreign Account Tax Compliant Act. Uh, so they're going to go after everybody. So she's going to turn the IRS into a major weapon against the citizens of the United States. But simplify tax filing obligations in line with other comparable countries with lower tax gaps, including adopting my Tax Filing Simplification Act and using smart returns to improve honest reporting. Um, Honest reporting. Just the idea that she is the arbiter of what is honest or not is just a spooky 1984 mentality. Um, Redirect enforcement resources away from low-income taxpayers towards high-income taxpayers, Increase the non-filer compliance program, strengthening reporting requirements for international income. Use existing currency transaction reports to enforce cash income compliance, 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 compliance. So uh, get get ready. You're about to get a call from an IRS agent, boys. <clears throat> Good luck. Well, luckily, all my LLCs all report you know massive losses every year. <laughs> excellent and uh, and the state we live in has already screwed me over on my supplemental income that i was making money on so i can't play this i was a semi-pro poker player so they, they uh don't let me do that online anymore they literally shut my dad's business down for mm-hmm. 70 dollars worth of uh sales tax on products he never sold you know like they just crip they completely froze his bank accounts for a month uh, and he was barely able to run his business for a month over seventy dollars while he disputed the this with the IRS. I mean, it was insane. Um, and there's no recourse if you win. They're like, oh, our bad. You can't like sue him for that money you lost. 
-hmm. the amount of money that you have to spend with good accountants to prove what you actually paid is just Mm -hmm. insane. Like it's, she, she has no idea that this is the, one of the more damning things that she would ever do as a president. Right. Yeah. Now go back to the, now let's put the tinfoil hats on. Okay. Let's go back to 2008. Well, it was, yeah, 2008 when Obama used the IRS to go after a conservative group and no one complained, no one cared. So looks like boop, 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 boop. People I love care. IRS agents when they go right. after people We've in real life. that with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau she set up. But yeah, it people were okay with it. Yeah, it was basically a, uh, a an agency that was there to protect consumers, mm-hmm. but she filled it with cronies. Obama appointed a bunch of her friends and they were just going after conservative leaning hedge fund managers. <laughs> so <laughs> the bursars were getting pinged uh, and Democrat donors weren't. So, yeah, I mean, that's a long history going all the way back to Kennedy mm-hmm. using the IRS to go after political opponents, right? I mean, that's, yeah. and, and people were trying to say that Obama wasn't doing that. And I'm like, he was definitely doing that. There was all kinds of evidence that he was doing that and he should have impeached for it. But what are you going to do? So the next section is targeted taxes on the financial sector, large corporations and the top 1%. So she's going to raise $800 billion in revenue by taxing uh, financial transactions. So like one-tenth of 1% on the sale of bonds, stocks, or derivatives. Uh, I'm going to mute. There you go. Thank you. Um, Sorry, it was just very breathy there for a moment. I felt like I was in a wind tunnel because of Reinhold had had, had, (laughs) it. (laughs) <laughs> so, sorry. no no i was hovering too close to the mic <laughs> i start talking and there's just a collective <sighs> um so you're going to pay taxes if you're an investor so if you're somebody who is financially secure who likes to invest their money in taxes get a 21 percent on your return on investment over the course of 20 years you're going to pay uh this 800 billion dollars in new taxes they're going to impose a fee on big banks that encourages them to take on fewer liabilities and reduce the risk they pose to the financial system. Uh, a small fee that applies only to the 40 or so largest banks in the country would generate $100 billion over the next 10 years. Uh, businesses will still write off the depreciation of their assets. Assets They'll just do it in a way that more accurately reflects the actual loss in value. So that's going to, if you, if you depreciate assets on your taxes, you're going to help participate in paying an extra $1.25 trillion over the next 10 years. Um, They're going to stop giant multinational corporations from calling themselves American companies while sheltering their profits in foreign tax havens. Um, So uh, she's going after companies that are multinational conglomerates that are like a Dow Chemical that, or or an Eli Lilly that have uh, China and, and, uh, Ireland and other places where they have um, offices and, and, and try to shield themselves from paying too much in taxes because every dollar they pay in taxes is another dollar they can't pay an employee or for benefits, by the way. Shield themselves from taxes, keeping servers away from the United States government. You know, same thing, right? Same exactly. thing. That's- well, the reason yeah. we have the lowest unemployment in history is because they lowered the capital, they lowered business taxes. And the principle of business taxes is that it's a double taxation on the American public. So all these business taxes are you paying taxes twice. If you go to the store and you buy, let's, let's say, rice, okay? And you pay the sales tax, you pay whatever taxes the rice maker had, you know, you pay the taxes, whatever the bag that the rice comes in, they, they pay, they're carrying that cost on to you. So for every dollar that a business pays in taxes, they're passing that on to you, the consumer. So you're being double taxed. And the problem and the benefit of what they did on, this is the only good thing that Trump has really done other than the Gorsuch is cutting that uh, corporate tax rate is what that does is that frees up capital for employers to hire new people. And so when a a company basically has three places they can kind of pay taxes out of, right? They can lower the amount that they're giving to their stockholders, which they don't want to do because they want to maintain competitive advantage and they want to um, make sure that they're growing in, in terms of investment capital. 
or they can uh, lo- hire they can raise the cost of their goods which the competitive nature of products these days is a non-starter because you've got to be right right in that wheelhouse or third they just uh, pay their employees less hire less people and give them less benefits which is what most of the people what most of the corporations in this country do and when they pay less in corporate taxes that means you and I get paid more there are more jobs available and we get more benefits and so if anybody tells you otherwise, they're lying to you. Um, Elizabeth Warren is just, she's not a stupid person. Like, I don't know how, why she thinks that any of this is going to work. Well, and the, and the ironic part, too, is that the Democrats were coming out and screaming about how tariffs were taxes. Speaking it's of- like, yeah, how can you say that and not understand what you're doing is a tax on the people, too? Let me just read this to you. Funny you should mention tariffs. My plan would also collect America's fair share of profits that foreign companies make by selling their products to Americans. Today we have a global tax deficit. Companies that sell their goods abroad don't have to pay the extra taxes that they would have to pay if they were subject to making a minimum effective tax rate in the company they operated in. Uh, In other words, uh, if a foreign company should owe an additional $1 billion in taxes if it were subjected to a country-by-country minimum tax, the U.S. would collect a fraction of that $1 billion based on the amount of sales that company would make in the U.S. So they're going to add a minimum tax and the taxation of foreign firms um, based on their domestic sales, and it's going to result in an additional $1.65 trillion in revenue. The thing about all these little taxes that you have to remember is that they start very small. The income tax started at, what was it, 4%, 2%? Just 2 and Wilson, yeah, it was very much smaller. They, they, I think they, they wanted to put into the amendment that there was a max that there would be, and people were like, "There's no way it would ever get above five, ten percent, or whatever." Something yeah, like Wilson mm-hmm. promised it just wouldn't happen. By yeah. 1959, it was ninety percent on some portions of the brackets. I mean, it was insane. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you had uh, Kennedy lower that tax burden, and then he got killed for it. Uh, <laughs> So they're going to raise another $3 trillion over 10 years by asking the top 1% of households in America to pay a little more. Her ultra-millionaire tax, a two-cent tax on the wealth of fortunes above $50 million, tackles this head-on. Under this tax, the top 0.1%, the wealthiest 75,000 Americans would have to pitch it in, just pitch it in, two cents for every dollar of net worth above $50 million and three cents for every dollar on net worth over $1 billion. With this version of the ultra-millionaire tax in place, the tax burden on the wealthiest households would increase from 3.2% to 4.3% of total wealth. Uh, Better is still below the 7.2% that the bottom 99% are projected to pay. Uh, Today, she's going one step further, she says, by asking billionaires to pitch in six cents on each dollar of net worth above $1 billion, and they can uh, raise an additional $1 trillion in revenue that way. Um, so, uh, she weirdly, uh, brings in immigration reform. Um, she, you know, has some platitudes. Um, she wants to expand legal immigration consistent with her principles. That's not only the right thing to do, it increases federal revenue that we can dedicate to Medicare for all as new people come into the system and pay taxes. Uh, so amnesty. So basically it's sort of like one of the more cynical things that somebody can say is like, I want to legalize a bunch of people so I can tax them, <laughs> tax them to death, um, which tells you they're not people to her. They're really just uh, tax buckets. They're wallets for her to steal out of. Right. A revenue source. Yeah. It would sure up social security. A lot of things that we just, you know, well, we have these legals. What was it? The uh, article yesterday about how the United States is in a negative growth rate, you know, without mm-hmm. bringing in, immigrants we're going to just keep getting smaller and smaller all these people are retiring the boomers are retiring there's no way it's gonna we're gonna be able to do social security so they have to bring in some other resources yeah but then you you also can look at the um speaking of medicaid for all if there's been tons of articles posted about the national health services in um, the uk being drained just by having their open boarding systems so there's that too all right. Uh, yeah, uh, UK health systems. Yeah, where the, they're drinking plants out of the water, uh, or drinking the water out of the plants. Right, and, and it was also determined that they, you know, they were trying to say that nobody could get private insurance because only the rich would be able to afford to. And their Supreme Court's not—it's not the Supreme Court, but you know, their top court determined that 
they couldn't tell them that they couldn't buy insurance. So now all the rich people are just going to buy their own insurance, getting off the, you know, not putting their money into the, the public system and it's just starting to crash around them. And it's what happens. All right. Finally, we're going to rein in some defense spending. Uh, they're going to shut down the slush fund and balancing our overall defense priorities in the context of the actual defense budget. And as we end these wars, eliminating overseas contingency operations fund and forcing the Pentagon to fund any such priorities through its regular budgetary process will provide $798 billion over the 10-year period relative to current spending levels. So, can, I, can I laugh hysterically right now at that yes. statement? Because <laughs> it's not going to have, oh, we're, we're going to put a Democrat in and we're going to have less war. That's going to work. That happens all the time. It's just like when the Republicans say they're going to do all this stuff when they get in and they don't do any of it. Or Democrats are going to do all this stuff and they're not going to do any of it. It's, it's all about how can we keep things running enough that we can keep enough division between ourselves so we can keep getting elected so we can keep promising things and never fulfilling them. Right. <laughs> that, that may say they may, they may have come across a little cynically. And yeah. uh, I just wanted to point out that it was meant to. So. Oh, good. Okay. I'm just simply going to point out the CIA is going to get back into drug running. I hope. What do you so. mean get back in? <laughs> well, that's the thing you do when you're financially strapped and hard up for cash. You start selling drugs. So. Right. You, yeah. You sell. Well, drugs. yeah. When you when you've got people and you know trying to figure out where the black money is going from, you got to get the money somehow to to run your coups, right? So you can't do it on the books because Wait, you're running coups. You know, look, look what happened to uh, you know. Reagan almost got caught with the Iran Contra stuff, right? Well, so he was, they had they had to go underground with that. They had to get that off the books what, to, what to run you, their stuff. What do you think mm -hmm. coups means? What did you did you mean to say coups? Coup. Yeah, coup. coup. Oh, coups. coups. Yeah, coup d'etat. <laughs> Multiple coups. Yeah. I was thinking ahead, and I heard you that you were running coups, which is a completely different thing. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you're 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 running prostitutes. Okay. <laughs> I was like, what did I just hear? Well, you know, you got to make money on the side around here. You can't just, you should always be working. You always should, you should it's, it's a hard life, man. No sex pimping, pimping is hard. <laughs> um, so here's some of the responses to the plan. Uh, the New York Times said, while the proposal allows Ms. Warren to say that she is not raising taxes on the middle class, it opened her renewed charges that her plan is too radical to pass through Congress. It represents an extraordinary embrace to the tax system to redistribute wealth and re-engineer on the pillars of the American economy with measures that would double her proposed wealth tax on billionaires and impose new levies on investment gains and even stock trades. Uh, the debate, Larry Levitt said, uh, the vice president of health policy at the Kaiser Family Foundation, has moved so far left, so fast within the, within the Democratic Party, it makes your head spin. Ideas that used to be political third rails are now being proposed by one of the leading candidates for president. Well, I don't think it's going to happen again after this. Uh, now, under Ms. Ms. Warren's plan, private health insurance, which now covers most of the population, would be eliminated and replaced by free government health coverage for all Americans. That is a fundamental shift from a market-driven system that has defined health care in the U.S. for decades but produced inequalities in quality, service, and cost. It's going to happen in a, private, a public system, too. Uh, this is not a symbolic proposal. This is the most specific plan for Medicare for All that's ever been proposed by a candidate. Candidates often pivot to the center on issues in the, gener in the general election. This proposal will make it more difficult for Warren to do that on health care. Um, it's so going to make it difficult for any of them to do it because now she's just tarred every Democrat with that plan. Yes. I mean, it's, it's a stunningly... Right. So, right, but so all the Democrats are out now bashing it because they know they have to in order to get it off of their plate. Mm -hmm. I mean, just if you listen to the the left wing blogs and and podcasts and everything else, like five thirty eight, they were just destroying her over this plan. So people on the left aren't happy that this came out. Yeah, because you don't actually say this shit out loud, right? Yeah, you don't put the facts, the money down. You know, you 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 keep you give yourself weasel words and weasel statements, and you know, and feeling good terms, she platitudes, propaganda. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's how you do it. Mm -hmm. 
nut numbers and actually how you're going to get that cash because a lot of them looked at there and was like, hey, that's me. I, that's my money. Yes. That's oh, they were just like, they were going off on 538 about how it's a, it's a head tax. You know, it's like, we're, you can't say it's not. It is. You know, so yep. they're just giving her all kinds of crush for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so how much would doctors and hospitals, the New York Times continues, and other providers be paid? This is a part that we never really got to, but a big part. Um, doctors, nurses, hospitals would be paid too little. And you risk hospitals closings and unhappy healthcare providers pay too much and the system will become far more expensive. In our current health, in our current system, doctors, hospitals, and other healthcare providers are paid by a number of insurers and those insurers all pay them significantly different prices. In general, private insurance pays medical providers more than Medicare does. Under a Medicare system for all, um, it, it would pick up all the bills. Paying the same prices that Medicare pays now would be an effective pay cut for medical providers who currently see a lot of patients with private insurance. Well, that would be a real problem. Um, it would uh, end up meaning that doctors who have a tremendous amount of debt because of their schooling probably wouldn't take, choose to take on that debt and you'd see a glut. You combine that with uh, a president like Donald Trump who sees uh, closed borders as the right solution. Hospitals are struggling to have doctors uh, work in there. Uh, like Johns Hopkins, for instance, is absolutely in a glut for doctors because many of their doctors are from India or China or from overseas. And so they're not properly staffed right now because visas haven't been extended. And if you think that the Trumpian ideas of immigration are going to go away in this generation now, you're fooling yourself. Um, so you could have another president come in and, and change that structure, and you could see even more. The most vulnerable hospitals that are going to lose staff rapidly and close are going to be in rural areas. You already have people who are two hours away from Indianapolis needing to drive to Indianapolis if they have a real emergency. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to see more uh, uh, helicopter services maybe out in rural areas because you're not going to have a, a hospital close by. So, you know, you've seen the stroke signs, seconds count. Well, it's going to be much more difficult as rural schools close as rural hospitals close, as less corporations start building in rural areas as they already are, less people will live in rural areas and the financial dependence on the government from rural areas will increase. Um, so I should also mention that's where the bulk of the opioid crisis is. So that's where a lot of the help is mostly most badly needed. Uh, so it's a real problem because you, you, if you don't see the financial incentive uh, to become a, a highly trained professional like a doctor, then you're just not going to do it. And so it could be a, a serious problem. Uh, how much more would people use the healthcare system? It'd give insurance to around 28 million more Americans. And so obviously if it's quote unquote free, more people are going to use it. It's going to increase wait times. It's going to increase the amount of usage. It's going to, and, and as you have less providers, less hospitals, less doctors, and more people trying to come into the system, guess what? You get more wait times. Does, no matter how much she writes in this plan that you're going to get who you want, when you want, where you want, how much you want, mm -hmm. uh, and not pay for it, she's lying. She knows she's lying. She's just lying. She's just a liar. She's a lying, lying, liar. <laughs> Other changes to Medicare for All would also tend to increase he healthcare spending. Some proposals would eliminate nearly all co-pays and deductibles. Evidence shows that people tend to go to the doctor more when there's no cost sharing. Um, the proposed plan also covers things like dental care, hearing aids, and optometry services. So your trip to Dr. Tavel or the dentist is going to take longer too because less dentists, less, uh, less dentists, less incentive to be a dentist, then uh, longer lines there. It'll just be harder and harder and harder to get any kind of health care in this country. Um, you can you hear people talk about well these we're the only industrialized nation that doesn't have this. We're 370 million people. We're not Luxembourg with 800,000. Comparing ourselves to Canada, which has 30 million people, which is roughly the size of New York, New York I believe, just New York City, um, it's ludicrous. It's a ludicrous fantasy. Numbers matter. Population matters. That's 340 million more people than Canada. 
That's 300. That's an exponential number, uh, an order of mass that is just uh, beyond the imagination of apparently Elizabeth Warren. Now, what would Medicare? Uh, let's skip this part. Um, Joe Biden questioned it, um, basically saying it's impossible to pay for it without middle class tax increases. Uh, her plan would create a new tax on employers of almost $9 trillion that would come out of workers' pot pockets, Biden says. So he was critical of it. Pete Buttigieg says uh, it was too inflexible. This my way or the highway idea, either you're kicking everybody off their private plans in four years or you're for business as usual is just not true. Rahm Emanuel called it a pipe dream. He's the former chief of staff for Obama. Um, he said his, her campaign would forever be associated with it to it, her detriment. This was Bernie's idea, and she now owns the idea, he said. This issue is not going to happen, and it's not the way you argue health care. Uh, even Saturday Night Live made fun of it. Mark Cuban tweeted, let's be real. Elizabeth Warren probably is the smartest of all the candidates. In intellectually, she knows she is misleading the public. The chances of getting all the necessary line items she needs for Medicare for All approved within four years are nearly impossible. Uh, Slate criticized it by calling it, quote, kind of unfair, since she would tax companies based on how much they spend on insurance today. Um, it's basically an upside down reward for bad business owners. Uh, the People's Policy Project explained Warren's Medicare fee is basically a head tax. As uh, Reinhold noted, uh, the head tax was controversial in leftist circles. Um, Steve Perlstein in the Washington Post said the senator from Massachusetts wants us to believe that we can extend health care to 32 million uninsured Americans while letting everyone else consume all the tests and procedures they want without worrying about copays and deductibles and do it all at the same cost and with the same number of medical professionals, MRI machines, and operating rooms, uh, meaning she's lying. The bulk of Warren's presumed savings in this area, P Peter Suderman in Reason wrote about $1.2 trillion, comes from increasing the use of bundled payments. Bundled payments in which healthcare providers are paid a sort of package deal rather than a fee-for-service basis were once a source of great hope for America's healthcare workers. The class of people who believe that the best way to reduce healthcare spending is through technocratic fixes that are often lumped together as delivery system reforms. Some early studies found spending reductions for hospitals that chose to participate, and initial projections by the CBO projected big, bigger savings down the road. Yet, as it turned out, there was a problem with those initial studies. They looked at hospitals that had chosen to participate, skewing the sample towards institutions where bundled payments were more likely to be effective. Um, when looked at it closely, the sort of all-star academic lineup that a committed Wong like Warren ought to trust were able to study data from a randomized sample. They found no significant savings, especially after prog program bonuses were factored in. Similarly, a study published by the Fiscally Conservative Commonwealth Foundation reported that hospitals participating in Medicare's most recent bundled payment system uh, initiative did not have lower costs or better outcomes compared with hospitals not participating. So uh, basically, her idea doesn't work on the smaller scale. Why would it when it hits the larger scale? So the reality is that uh, the, the left keeps pushing this idea of Medicare for all in a single payer system. These two episodes will hopefully give you a better understanding of this is the best detail that we've been given by anyone about how any of this might work uh, from a politician who had the guts to put this out. Uh, much to her detriment, but uh, I, I hope you see clearer now the absolute folly of a single-payer system and why it just wouldn't work. Uh, it doesn't work on any of the ideas. Not only is it not effective, it's not going to do what she says, and the incentives are bad all the way up and down. So uh, it's a no for me, gentlemen. Yeah, and for me too, but also remember, this isn't the first time this has been detailed. It was once before um, where we would have medic they didn't call it Medicare for all, but that was when Hillary Clinton was in charge of trying to rewrite our health care system back in what, 97, 96, 97. And she came up with a plan that would penalize doctors for all kinds of things and 
uh, it just became a complete and total mess and, and a failure. And it just, it got shot down. So it's part of the reason why the Republicans took over the house um, was because of her pushing that medical plan. Yeah. I believe that was 93 and then they took over. Oh yeah. It was 93. Yeah. It was 93. 93. Yep. Cause it was, yeah. The first, after the first year, it was like the first thing Bill Clinton comes in he says, I'm going to put my wife, she's very smart. I'm going to put her in charge of figuring out healthcare. And it was just the biggest mess. Yeah. Imagine she's completely ineffective. As former co-host Greg Lenz used to say, her biggest political accomplishment was marrying Bill. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is right. why she's still married to Bill, even though everything Bill does. Yes. Uh, <laughs> all right. Final thoughts, Harry Price. All right. You are correct. Like the, the, the bravery of her to be able to put this thing down on paper, because if anyone as you go on your journey of like dealing with politics stuff like that it is very hard to argue with a lot of people who are on the left and some people on the right and some people on the right and some left that until they actually say put down on pen to paper or put down figures it's really hard to argue with and tear their i you know not tear their ideas down but it's like okay let me show you why i disagree with this it's very easy to show why i disagree with this and you know and try to get people on the same page it's easy to say something that you want and keep you know like and just be mystified and have all these weasel words in your statement as long as you don't you don't get concrete you be like jello your entire argument is jello you know you become untouchable and everyone thinks you're just winning and everything yeah. what she did went from jello to concrete right. <laughs> so it's very easy to take a hammer to it uh, which it's I wish more people in that type of political aspect, you know, like that aspiration. It's like, you know what, like some of these things you could probably get and w- that you want if you're willing to actually put pen to paper because we can, you know, we can move things around and get the things that you want and show you why, you know. So honestly, it's like it's this, these ideas suck. They, they would suck with the weasel words, but thank you for putting pen to paper. Thank you for actually putting it out there and how you've done it and how much this thing's going to cost. Cause it's a boondoggle. And it's going to cost a whole much more. It's going to be, it's, it's a ridiculous amount of money. No matter how you square it, square it up. And you try to say other countries do it for cheaper. They don't, right. they don't, you know, it's, it's when they do it cheaper, it's worse service. The lines and the lines are longer. Yeah. It's a, Are you playing with your pussy, Reinhold? Maze wanted to say hi. Oh, that's oh, such, a, such an awful joke. Shut up, Harry. Boo, boo. Oh, boo so. <laughs> it's a boo. It's a boomer joke, right? Yeah. Is that uh, Simpsons? Uh, boo this man. <laughs> <laughs> that so uh, came from a half baked. Okay. Yeah, Bob Saget was sitting there. I met Bob Saget. Bob Saget came to the Bob and Tom show, and I met him there. Just a couple weeks ago, wasn't it? Like a month ago. Yeah, he was so nice. Hmm. Hmm. Final thoughts, Reinhold? Um, It's like I said back when Hillary Clinton was trying this out. I said, the the only way you're going to fix Medicare or the medical system is you need to either stay out of it or take complete control of it. The the middle-of-the-road stuff is just going to cause more middlemen, more problems, that sort of thing, and She's trying to go the other way, which is um, boot to the next solution, as opposed to letting innovation and letting what we know works for everything else we do. Like we don't have a a whole um, program set up for everybody to have phones, cell phones. Yet everybody has cell phones. They work great. Uh, They get, you know, better and better every year. Nobody's unhappy with their cell phone services and stuff. So, um, just not understanding that that's how things have have made our country what it is by letting innovation and letting people come up with the better solutions and letting the markets work. That's how we solve problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as we get more and more control over things, you get less and less innovation and people trying to do better because they're just, they're saying this is all we can do. This is good enough. So that it's not going to work this way. Uh, the best solution to me would be, like I said before, everybody should pay directly to their doctors, let them shop around for best prices. Uh, if they need, you know, everybody should have uh, possibly catastrophic insurance, which is much, much cheaper than health insurance. 
uh, just for major, you know, illnesses and diseases and things like that. Otherwise, uh, pay directly and watch those prices drop. Well, we're seeing that already. We see that a little bit already with the a la carte system that people have been doing, right? So the, um, uh, some of the doctors have been doing like, uh, you pay a monthly subscription fee and you can talk to the doctor online or you can go to an a la carte place and you can uh, choose to get these services for a, such a discounted price because they're not having to deal with insurance. Right. Um, we can do that and fix the system by letting our ingenuity that made us what we are uh, shine. Right. And this type of solution isn't going to cut it is never going to, achieve what they want to achieve, which is going to introduce more politics into the conversations you have with your doctor, which mm-hmm. I don't want the government involved in that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just add on to right now, I think it's like, it, it's entrenching like the taxi cab service. It's really allowing an Uber or a Lyft or a bird scooter to come in and innovate and do something different, you know, and now they card it how you want it. She's entrenching the taxi cab service. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us here on the program. It has been uh, two very good episodes. Thank you to my co-hosts, uh, Reinhold and Harry Price. And thank you to our patrons and thank you to all of our listeners. We do greatly appreciate it. And we will see you next Tuesday. And uh, hope you'll join us then.